Well, uh, well, thank you so much for um, inviting us to be here. I know this is quite an effort with the College of Pharmacy, Arizona Cancer Center, and um, AC Bio. I, uh, I thought to help um, kick off this session as part of the pre-session. Of course, we'll be talking about precision medicine, um, some back, the background about it and some updates, but also to help sort of set the stage with the broader themes for why I think we're all coming here today. It really is about interdisciplinary collaboration and also building bridges between um, uh, private and uh, academics and co companies, um, all with the goal of creating new therapies. So uh, with that in mind, a little while ago, the College of Law, the College of Pharmacy and the Critical Path Institute, we created a whole coursework around regulatory science that I just wanted to quickly tell you about before we get into more of the nuts and bolts. But, uh, so for example, we created this program because we heard from industry that uh, there's just a big knowledge gap with how we can prepare the workforce, researchers, pharmacists, um, to, get, to go ahead and um, be more familiar with the FDA and some of the regulatory guidance that's needed to bring a, a new therapy to market. And they made it quite clear we don't want more lawyers, no need to send anyone to law school, but can we please help improve the collective knowledge base so that we don't have to backtrack, uh, we can save time and money and, and be much more efficient with creating um, safe and effective treatments. So I gave a little bit of the iceberg um, examples of that it is very active in the COVID space right now with everything from off-label prescribing to emergency use authorization. These are the kinds of things that we talk about in the curriculum. Um, because we are talking about precision medicine specifically, I did note things that are quite common with clinical trials in relation to where you'd really want to bring in um, some of the ethical principles and research, particularly around informed consent, obtaining meaningful informed consent, and what that can mean um, when you're talking about issues like using the data for secondary research, risk of re-identification re -identification of data, accessibility to data for both the patients and for the public, and then I think what's also complicated, especially for um, those conducting clinical trials uh, internationally, is even if you want to be compliant with privacy, it's not always clear how to be compliant given the different evolving privacy regimes. So these are all things we try to cover, which, are, which go along very well with the clinical side of what you're trying to achieve with the treatments. Um, the last thing I just want to touch on with what we, we try to do in all of our courses is these broader policy considerations. Things like precision medicine, is, there's a lot of costs associated with developing um, the outcomes for that. And so related to that, um, you have to discuss issues like access and equity. Uh, so this is just a quick snapshot of now we have a year-round curriculum. Uh, the very first course is John Michael's course that he's delivering right now at Arizona Law. And it's aptly named for the summit, drug discovery and development. Um, we also offer a course in clinical research ethics, again, talking about some of those um, informed consent issues, uh, including vulnerable populations. And, um, and in particularly what's often left off the table is why we have um, these laws and regulations and uh, issues in the first place. And it's because of some really um, unethical treatment of uh, human participants Past. So that's also covered in the course. Uh, and we have um, two other courses from the Critical Path Institute um, on diagnostics and devices, which we um, work closely with approach. Uh, we also have a great case study project that's taught by an alumnus of the College of Pharmacy, uh, Dr. Stephen Carpin. And, and granted, um, we have a course on products and what I really think is important about this course is it's entirely from a patient or patient advocate perspective in terms of how to access non-approved medical therapies uh, and, and we're doing that in collaboration with NYU. Uh, we have a, a course just on devices we'll be offering next summer with the International Society for Translational Research or International Cardiovascular, it's a long name, International Society for Cardiovascular Translational Research. And then, and then lastly, what I think is so great for an ongoing year-round discussion is we do do a colloquium where we encourage, encourage all of you to attend, um, participate, maybe even speak at. And it's a way where it's not these isolated one-off events, but really a way to keep the discussion and networking going year-round. 
Um, again, we created this program because we saw there was a real need. It really couldn't just be addressed by a single college or even the health sciences. It, it did involve law, business, and engineering, along with guidance from industry in terms of what they need, needed in the workforce. Um, uh, very flexible as to how to engage in these topics. Um, it could be a single course, such as uh, John Michaels that's on uh, drug discovery and development. We do offer a whole certificate in regulatory science, which is uh, four courses. And then, and, then, and then these also can all lead to a master's if that is of interest. Um, and then lastly, you don't really need to take any actual coursework to just be involved in these issues that might be of interest um, to you or to your company or your colleagues. Um, we just have a lot of events, almost all virtual at the moment, but um, where a lot of networking and sharing of resources can take place. And that really is the goal is to improve the overall uh, knowledge base. So we have the regulatory science program that I've been touching upon, but we also offer three other certificates in health law. Most recently, we'll be delivering one starting in January on health information, privacy, and data security. And that's in collaboration with Health Current, which is the state health information exchange. And I think it dovetails really well with the current curriculum and that we can talk about data sharing agreements, governing health information technology, um, and then, of course, privacy will, will come up in that program. We try to make it as, as, as easy and adaptable as possible, where students can take um, four courses for the admission, and then they can uh, take additional courses to be part of the overall master's, which really is treating students almost like uh, first-year law students, where they get a sense of how to write and read a contract. Um, and other uh, related issues. Uh, I just want to quickly wrap up so we can get to the precision medicine focus. But um, this is an, an alumnus of pharmacy, and he also was at CPATH, and he, uh, Michael Abramson. You can just tell it was the whole goal of how to properly prepare the workforce um, in a way that's more efficient going forward, where he's a pharmacist with a regulatory science training and how much that fed into his uh, personal passion as well. And then related to that, we have Amy over at the Arizona Cancer Center that uh, runs clinical trials, and, uh, and she basically really wanted to take this program to upscale and network. Uh, we work very closely with Roche, um, and they want to have the pipeline come in, and, uh, and, they, and they also want to continue to upscale their workforce. So we have a nice back and forth um, interaction with Roche uh, Ventana Medical Center here in Tucson. Um, and then lastly, we have an incredible alumnus of both law and pharmacy, Brian, and I really love how succinctly he put this. There's just a crying need for those that have a clinical background to also understand the regulations and how much time and money that could save from the very beginning if we just try to, to train the new workforce with both of those uh, backgrounds in mind. Oh, this is now shot of our events. This is not the first time John Michael and I have presented together. It certainly won't be the last. Um, and we're very active and we really are being free of, free of charge and really just encourage a lot of participation from any, every discipline. Uh, there's some uh, websites here if this program is of interest or any of our events. Um, also, my uh, personal email address and Twitter information, and I'd really be delighted to hear from you, and I look forward to um, all the talks today. Uh, thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks, Tara. That was a, that was a great introduction. Um, you know, a few years ago when we started talking about um, putting um, our, our course together, um, Sorry, I'm having a problem sharing here, of course. We started talking about putting the course together. Um, you know, we, we were really hoping that what we could do is we could pull together, you know, experts um, from uh, across the globe to go ahead and participate in these courses. And that's exactly what we did. So the nice part is, is you don't have to listen to uh, myself or, or uh, or Jennifer drone on within these courses. Instead, you know, we, we've uh, basically uh, pulled across the expertise 
um, um, in order to, to, to conduct this course. So again, what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a, a really a, a quick overview of, of what we're doing within the course so you know what it's about. And then really the tease is going to be around precision medicine, which is one of the topics that we talk about within the course. I'd just like to show you how we go through this. Um, so uh, both myself as well as Jennifer Berkey um, uh, host uh, this uh, drug development course. Um, and, and what we do is, as I said, we, we pull, you know, folks from FDA, from industry, uh, from uh, academia to talk specifically about these projects. So the nice part is the students are hearing from the experts, right? It's not recycled material. Instead, it's real material um, that brings up live examples and, and real, real time examples. Um, you know, this, this was really my first adventure into an online course. And so, you know, we tried a couple different things and we were experimental as far as doing interviews with folks and panel sessions. And I think it worked out really well. And, and I, I think it's a good, good course. The interaction online is great, um, going back and forth with individuals. And, and so it, it's worked out uh, pretty well. So this is what we're really trying to do within the course is, is really talk about the U.S. Uh, as, as well as uh, OUS regulatory systems, um, also describe, you know, various applications and techniques that are used within drug development for the successful um, uh, bringing forward a, of a drug. And also talk about some of the hurdles, um, as well as some of the, the complexities uh, that, that, that are around the, the economics of, of drug uh, development and marketing. So, here goes the teaser part. So really what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about precision medicine. And, and this is medical care designed to optimize the, the efficacy or therapeutic benefits, so that can include safety, of, uh, of a particular group of uh, patients. You know, and this specifically uses, in many cases, genetics and molecular profiling to go ahead and better design drug treatments for individuals. And so I, I know another word that you guys have heard out there, and that's, that's personalized medicine. And that's really the same thing as precision medicine. I know some people have tried to cut it definitionally, but, but there's no reason to do that. So really what the main goal is, is to have the right treatment for the right patient at the right time in their disease. And like I said, the, the, the primary techniques that are utilized are um, next generation sequencing, right, to understand genetic differences in individuals that make them um, uh, more susceptible to the positive effects of a drug and make them less susceptible to the negative effects of a drug. Um, pharmacogenetics are also applied within the area of precision medicine. And this is basically understanding an individual's uh, ability to metabolize or um, distribute a drug within the body and how that's different from one individual to another. I mean, I think probably the most common example are the cytochrome P450s, which have variation across individuals. And, and what we see is that in some cases, some individuals will, will clear drugs slower um, than other individuals because they lack that, that, that important uh, oxidative enzyme. Um, and, 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 and that could result in better efficacy in some cases. It could result in, in adverse events. Likewise, there's also molecular profiling that's going on within precision medicine. And this is the use of fluid and imaging biomarkers to really understand how an individual is going to re can respond to a drug or is responding to a drug. So I, I think if we look across um, um, drug development just in general, what we find is that drugs are not effective in everyone, right? We see that, that they're based on diseases. There are different um, uh, levels of efficacy that are actually noticed across the population. And, and likewise, it's very difficult to um, predict um, adverse events and poor outcomes. And so what, what precision medicine allows us to do um, beyond this traditional approach is really begin to basically identify the patients in which therapies will be most, most effective and I identify those individuals that are most at risk for adverse events, right? It's, it's, it's the dream, right? The perfect drug for the perfect individual, right? And this really represents, in my mind, the modernization of the, the, the drug development process. Interestingly, if you look across the past several years, what we find is that approximately a third of drugs are actually precision medicines right, applying the use of either genetics or, or phenotypic 
um, uh, readouts to go ahead and decide whether or not an individual is, is eligible uh, for a medication. Uh, interestingly, the, the 2009 uh, bar uh, uh, and report uh, just came out, and, and so you can see the 2009 bar, and we actually see a little bit of a drop off. I, I was I was guessing, you know, based on everything that in, in 2019 we would actually see an increase, but we, we've kind of steadied off there. Um, so I, I think the, the 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 interesting part is that precision medicine is also going to be a very disruptive force uh, across healthcare as well, because if indeed we're, we're now able to target medications for individuals, this is not only going to affect how drugs are being discovered and developed but it also has to affect regulatory policy, the incentives, coverage, reimbursement, et cetera. And I think most importantly, how do we actually take these new technologies, these new measures, and actually apply them in the clinical practice? So, I mean, a lot of good news on one side, but then also a lot of work to be done uh, on the other side. There is no doubt that, that the economics of medicine are gonna change. You can imagine if you have a, a compound that, or a drug that, that now is showing substantial efficacy across the population, there's the opportunity to, to actually charge more, right? Because it's more effective, it's safer. And so this is gonna change how the economics of, of healthcare uh, uh, operate. And so this is something that we need to be thinking about how we get prepared for in the future. Um, luckily, um, uh, under uh, uh, President Obama, there, there was the uh, FDA's Precision Medicine Initiative that was initiated in 2015. And, and really what the goal of this is to figure out how to best begin to implement this science, you know, across healthcare, you know, specifically across drug development. And there were two main pieces that were, that you can pull out of uh, this document, which is really, you know, streamlining the regulatory process for next generation sequencing, right? How do we best use this new tool, right? And then likewise, how, how do we enable uh, patients to access their own information and what's the software that's required to go ahead and actually be able to, to accurately interpret this information in, in, in an ethical manner, right? In an informed manner as well. <clears throat> so also, if you look across um, the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative, you know, there, there were some other pieces that were, were definitely baked in there around, you know, better treatments for cancer. We know that, that the oncology community is the leader within precision medicine right now. If you look across the, the drugs that I, I listed in the previous bar chart, the majority of those are uh, oncology drugs. Um, uh, and so I think now all the other therapeutic areas want to go ahead and, and be like oncology from the aspect of having these different tools to be able to apply. Um, there's also a large cohort that has been started, the um, Million Person Voluntary National Research, Research Cohort, which is to begin to collect uh, um, uh, baseline data around uh, individuals. So it's, kind of, it's a historic uh, uh, um, or, or, or a disease history or a, a normal history, if you will, uh, study to go ahead and collect these data to be able to, to serve as the uh, data set to begin to create, you know, standards and understand privacy as well as be able to, to, to find data sharing. And then that all goes into really patient protection of privacy. Likewise, I, I mentioned the, 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 the piece around the regulatory modernization. I'm going to go into that next. Um, and then also uh, within the Precision Medicine Initiative, there is also, you know, fostering pu uh, public-private partnerships, something that CPATH is really all about, and, and being able to, to help create this infrastructure that's going to be needed in the future um, in order for precision medicine to be successful. So again, what I'd like to do is I'd like to just simply and quickly go through two guidance documents that are really important. They both came out um, approximately two years ago in 2018. This is a, a clinical uh, a database guidance and then an analytical uh, validation guidance. Um, the uh, first guidance here is really around how we best use next generation sequencing, right? And what's required for the clinical uh, validation of, of establishing uh, genotype and phenotype relationships. This is fundamentally important, right? Because as with any biomarker, and that's, that's really what, what, what your genotype is in, in many ways, um, 
it, it has to relate to some type of outcome, right? Some hard endpoint, if you will. And that's really the important part, to be able to correlate those two so that you can better predict what is actually going to occur. And, and also, you know, what there was was really this, this um, approach to how regulatory oversight for next generation sequencing in vitro diagnostic tests would actually occur. And, and that's nicely documented um, within, this, um, within this guidance document. It's funny, when you read these guidance documents, they become a little bit technical at times and also a little bit philosophical at times. But if you dive into them deeply, what you can find are some really important nuggets around how to actually apply the science. And that's what FDA is trying to do here. They're not mandating a given approach. Instead, what they're doing is they're trying to provide an appropriate guidance on how to work through a given scientific question so that when it's presented to them, it's presented in a way that both groups can work together and, and come up with the, 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 the best approach. Um, so also, you know, within the, 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 the regulatory um, um, uh, modernization, uh, what we have is a, is a, a guidance uh, around developing enrichment strategies. And so how do we then apply not only the genetic data that can be derived, but then also that phenotypic data, biomarkers, may they be fluid or imaging. Now, the, the idea of many of these enrichment strategies are actually to make sure that we identify the population where the drug is going to work the best in, right? But you can flip that on its head a little bit, too, and actually then look at what uh, uh, groups are actually going to um, have the lowest level of adverse events or identify those groups that will have adverse events and then potentially avoid that medication or uh, uh, proceed with caution. Um, again, um, really, if you read through the, the document, it's, it's really around tailoring the treatments for those patients to um, find benefit based on clinical and uh, clinical laboratory genomic and, and, and proteomic factors. And, and, and the nice part is, if you go even deeper into the article, what you, into the, the, the guidance document, what you can actually see, see that there's really three strategies that are discussed within the document, right? And, and that's around decreasing heterogeneity or reducing noise within clinical trials, being able to predict what patient groups are going to respond the best to a given treatment, and then, uh, you know, predictive enrichment around, um, uh, around a, a given drug. In other words, how do you design uh, drug trials so that you more quickly get at the answer of whether or not your, uh, your, your, your drug is, is actually working or not? So, so, so again, you know, what we will see is, is that with the uh, implementation of uh, precision medicine, you know, we're going to identify patients where the therapy is most effective. We're going to reduce adverse events. As I said before, more effective therapies can demand premium pricing. Likewise, you know, if, if you can indeed demonstrate that your compound works in a larger subset of the population has a, uh, a superior safety profile, um, you know, that's an easier compound also to then receive regulatory approval around to be able to, to market it. Um, again, you know, precision medicine will be a disruptive force, but th this disruptive force actually results in significant opportunities. If we look across Arizona, really, we, we have a, a diagnostic corridor. You know, I'm more of a, 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 a biotech, biofarm guy. That, that's where I cut my teeth. But looking at what we have in Arizona, it, it, there's, there's a lot of uh, diagnostic horsepower. So how do we take advantage of this as, as Arizona? To, to, to be able to um, uh, invest in upcoming precision medicine opportunities and, and then be able to advance those opportunities for the good of all patients. So with that, I, I'd like to stop and then open this up for uh, any questions uh, for myself or for uh, Tara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Tara and John Michael. So if you have any questions um, for the uh, participants, uh, please put them in 
um, the um, uh, Q&A area. We do have one question, uh, so I'll read it to you. Segmentation of patient population reduces the market size for individual therapeutics, leading to increased drug costs as companies continue to seek profitability. The savings, however, may be seen in other healthcare sectors as improved outcomes. How can we tie the cost and savings together to realize the net savings? That's, that's a great question. Um, and I think that gets to the heart of really the disruptive feature of precision medicine, right? It means that who is currently, you know, uh, um, uh, reaping benefit from healthcare is going to change, right? There's no doubt that a smaller um, subset of patients where you see, you know, effecti uh, effectiveness go up that will result in that pre uh, premium pricing uh, aspect. And, and so, you know, hopefully there will then be these better outcomes, but that then moves money from, from one group to another group. And I, I think we just need to be prepared for that. Um, Tara, any additional comments? Sure, I mean, we have some precedent for this. This really comes back to just a different federal agency instead of the FDA, now we're talking more about CMS. And it's changing the reimbursement process where instead of a fee-for-service model in clinical care, we need more to pay for performance. And hopefully we can see more of that in this space as well, where you're looking at the overall outcomes um, as a way to save overall costs and potential adverse events, look at the whole picture as opposed to um, individual treatment. So I would say that's where the discussion again gets broader. We're not just talking about the FDA and approval. We're also thinking it has a reimbursement from the CMS and how that could help shape the future of precision. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Here's another one. Technology has led to our current strategy of genetic testing to drive precision medicine. What hurdles will need to be overcome before we can do a true phenotypic strategy to link multiple sources of inter-individual variability in drug response? So I, I can start off with that one. That's a really good question as well. So, you know, number one, I think there's an understanding gap, right? There, there, there's just the basic science that needs to happen where we can understand how to use these tools. Right now, many of these tools are very specialized as well. So there, that's the technology gap, right? How do we figure out how to pull these tools into clinical practice to make them more routine? That's going to be the change in healthcare that's going to occur, you know, over the next several years. Um, but, but, you know, as, 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 as scientists, as, as clinical investigators, we, we, we have a pretty big job in front of us, right? And that's understanding how to use these tools before they can be actually implemented in, in a much larger fashion. Um, Tara, any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, this, it just got me thinking about um, just in general, the different tools that are going to be coming available as, as we look at uh, sources of real world evidence in these trials as well. And, and and, and also um, electronic medical records. And there's just a lag behind how to regulate and enforce that things like privacy and confidentiality, which also go into this once you put the data out there. How do we ensure access, ensure privacy, ensure that the public can see it if it's de-identified? So I was just thinking about the additional types of data are related to the question. And it's a very good question. Uh, and it needs to still be a, a focus point of how we roll out this new new precision medicine tool. Yeah, Tara, Tara, that was that was great. I, I mean, bring, bringing up the, the the electronic health records and real world medicine registries, et cetera. You're right because what we also have to do, and that's piece of the that's the science piece, is how do we tie that technology to these outcomes, right? And there's a huge source of data out there. We're not going to be able to run prospective clinical trials on every you know test we want to. We need to figure out how to use that data that's collected every day at healthy, healthy visits or, or, or visits for, for, for a given disease within the, the, the current uh, uh, healthcare system to, to, to be able to link this all together. So great point. All right, are there any other questions today for our panelists?
All right. Well, Tara and John Michael, thank you for participating today. I love the talks. And I think the key part of all this that you point out here is that um, these type of programs that uh, you, you both have developed, uh, as well as other ones, um, I think is a great way to help uh, current students, whether they're undergrads or they're already in pharmacy school, medical school, dental school, pick whatever school you want, um, that it gives, gives them more options. And, and I know when I talk to uh, students, especially young ones and are in the middle of through the system, right, is they ought to always think about uh, expanding their repertoire and have better opportunities in the future. So I, I think what you guys are doing is great. Thank you. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you.